I was looking at where are we getting the majority of saturated fats from our diet? Yeah, the majority of saturated fats are really coming from mixed dishes. So that, you know, that's one of the challenges. There isn't one thing you can point to. So it's I landed mostly... on one food group. Did, oh, did well, you? Mix, mixed dishes and desserts. Pizza. Desserts. And... Pizza and saturated and baked goods. Yeah, at baked goods. Yeah. Um, pizza is a little more complicated. <laughs> I agree. Because... <laughs> I agree. But I here's what I was thinking. Mm. I was thinking, okay, so we're hearing this overarching message that we need to remove the amount of red meat or high quality protein. I mean, this is, again, this is what I'm interfacing with, which mm -hmm. is why I believe so strongly it's important to have experts like yourself on. And the messages that we're hearing is decreased dietary cholesterol, which I know that they took cholesterol out of the guidelines 2010, but this saturated fat thing could be a real issue. And then what's happening is I think people are pinning red meat, whether it's lean red meat or not, or white meat or any of these animal proteins as saturated fat when you had also mentioned that roughly 50 percent of the fat in these items are polyunsaturated and so that those or, are or kind of mono mo i'm sorry mm -hmm. monounsaturated mm -hmm. um and i just think we have to get really clear because the unintended consequences of these overarching themes can be devastating to an aging population i i agree i am concerned especially as people are moving from middle age into older ages about getting adequate protein. And uh, there was recently a publication that was addressing this issue of dietary protein specifically in people with kidney disease. And so we know that in advanced kidney disease, you do have to restrict protein. But most people with kidney disease have less advanced disease. And so the question is, do they need to be restricting protein? And so this was an observational study, but they looked at people with and without kidney disease, and they looked at total mortality in relation to protein intake. And the recommendation for protein intake is at least 0.8 grams per kilo of body weight mm -hmm. per day. And so they looked at 0.8 as kind of the reference point, and then they looked at each 0.2 increase. So they went from 0.8 all the way up to 1.6. And what they found is that with higher intake of protein in these older individuals, uh, there was lower total mortality. And that was especially true in people who are at least 75. And so I am really concerned about middle age and older people not getting sufficient protein intake. I don't think 0.8 is optimal. I think that something between 1.2 and 1.6 is my best estimate of what is likely to be associated with favorable health outcomes, not just mortality, but there have been other studies that have looked at protein intake in middle age and various health-related outcomes later in life, and higher protein intake from both animal and plant proteins is associated with more favorable health outcomes. Do you, are you in the social media sphere? Do you see what goes on online? Do you, do you actually witness? <laughs> I mean, a lot of academics m maybe take a step back, but do you see what is going on out there? I do. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's distressing because, you know, I'm a, a strong free speech advocate. And having said that, I read a lot of things online where I just shake my head and say, no, that's not what the evidence shows. And in fact, that's often the opposite of what the evidence shows. And seed oils is a real Let's talk about that. Topic. I, I would love <clears throat> to hear um, what your take is, what you're hearing, what the rhetoric is versus what the evidence uh, supports. So the claim is that if you consume seed oils that are high in linoleic acid, and omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid, that that will increase inflammation. And we know that chronic inflammation contributes to many diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, et cetera. Okay, so here's where that breaks down. That's based on a mechanism where the assumption is that if you consume a lot of linoleic acid, it'll be converted to arachidonic acid and then arachidonic acid is the precursor for these compounds, prostaglandins and leukotrienes, that are pro-inflammatory. 
Okay, looks fine on paper. The reality is that there are two problems with that. One is that pathway to convert linoleic acid to arachidonic acid saturates at a very low level of linoleic acid intake. So what does that mean exactly? That means that, you know, you will increase arachidonic acid levels if you start very, very low in linoleic acid. You consume more, you'll get more arachidonic acid up to a point after which you get no increase in arachidonic acid. Regardless of how much you are taking in because the body doesn't have the enzymes or the capacity to be able to... To keep converting. To keep converting to these leukotrienes and other various metabolites. Right. So that's the first problem. Second problem is... there a is, dose that we know of out of curiosity? Uh, it's about 2% of energy where it saturates. 2% of... You know, I always wonder about the percentage questions. Um... And I, I struggle with it a lot because we talk often about percentage of protein calories, percentage of mm -hmm. saturated fat. But if someone is having a 1,200 calorie diet versus a 4,400 calorie diet, those numbers are so variable. Yeah. And, and so that's an average and there's okay. variation around it. So that's the first problem. The second problem is you look at all of the studies done in humans. And when you feed increased linoleic acid, you get no increase in biomarkers of inflammation, like C-reactive protein is kind of the prototype for that. You just don't see it. And so we've done studies, other people have done studies, they do not show any increase in biomarkers of inflammation. And so the idea that you're having inflammation driven by increased linoleic acid intake just does not comport with the evidence from studies in humans. Secondly, when we look at the observational evidence, the more linoleic acid people consume or the more they have in their bloodstream um, in biomarker studies, the lower their risk of cardiovascular and other diseases. And then what is really lacking is randomized controlled trials. I wish we had those. We have some, but they're all very old and hard to interpret. And so the evidence with its limitations, would be consistent with the idea that higher intake of seed oils lowers risk of adverse cardiometabolic outcomes, not increasing risk. Where do you think that people have gone so wrong with it? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, I would say that they're probably unnatural. Um, again, whether that's good or bad, I, I do know that, for example, animal fats used in cooking is drastically been reduced since the 50s we seem to be turning to seed oil use is that is that true yeah i think there's more seed oil use and you know my mother used to save the bacon grease and the you know hamburger patty um, fat in, in a jar and reuse it uh, you know we don't do that anymore so <laughs> we don't wait we're not supposed to yeah, do that uh, uh, i'll <laughs> check your cabinet and... <laughs> we're not supposed to do that so um you know, I would say that, uh, you know, there are lots of things that have changed over time. And so what often happens is people come up with a mechanism and it's plausible, but then you have to look at the evidence and say, does the evidence support the importance of that mechanism? Because very often there are other mechanisms. As an example, linoleic acid lowers LDL cholesterol levels. We know that that's beneficial. Um, you know, I'm not averse to the... Were you surprised by that? The seed oil conversation? Or, I was, yeah. Yeah, you were. Because, and, you know, so the American Heart Association, as an example, put out a statement and the, the statement essentially said you should be replacing saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats because they have the most beneficial effects in animal studies, observational studies, limited clinical trial evidence, and they lower cholesterol more. So... Um, you know, these things... Did you take... agree with that statement? I did. Okay. Yeah. These things take on a life of their own on the internet. And you have very influential, charismatic people who are talking mostly to people who don't have the background to be able to interpret their suggestions. And you end up with a lot of people believing that seed oils are terrible when the evidence doesn't support that. Now, if I see evidence that leads me to believe the opposite is true, you know, the famous quote um, is uh, a reporter criticizing someone, uh, John Maynard Keynes, uh, 
was uh, supposedly the person who said this. And the reporter said, well, you said this, and now you're saying that. Why, why the difference? He said, well, when the data change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? <laughs> um, if I see the data that lead me to believe that, uh, that things are different from what I think the evidence supports now, I'll change my mind. But uh, lots of people would, you know, be very resistant to changing their minds.